Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today is going to be a PC review day. It's been a while since I've done one of these, and generally when I make one of these videos, I'm talking about mini PCs. You know, something like this one from B-Link or maybe one from Mini's Forum. I really enjoy reviewing these guys because they are super small, they have integrated graphics for the most part, but they can be relatively cheap. Maybe a couple hundred dollars for the cheaper ones, but all the way up to maybe like $800 for a high-end one that can play a lot of games, and emulation is usually really good on these too. So I'm always impressed with the small form factor and what it can do for that price point and the size. However, one of the many comments I get on these review videos is you could just build a desktop for cheaper. And I don't disagree with that. You can definitely do that. I have my own desktop PC that I built back about four years ago. I really like it and I've put in new and upgraded parts into it. It's one of the nice things about having one of those big desktop PCs is that you can swap out parts here and there. However, I think there's still a middle ground in there as well. Something like a small form factor PC. Now there's a couple different ways you can go about that. You could buy like a used desktop from like Dell and then you can put your own parts into it. I've seen those kind of videos from like ETA Prime. Those are always fun to watch but they're also very limited in terms of the size constraints and things like that. The other thing you could do is potentially get a small form factor case and then find all the parts to kind of Tetris it all together. And I think that's really fascinating as well, but not something I'm super interested in just because I know myself and I know that I would spend like months shopping around, finding the right parts, and then making sure they would all fit and then something would go wrong and I'd do all these software tweaks and I'd lose a month of my life. And even though that does sound kind of fun, I also have to run a YouTube channel and so I kind of like the idea of pre-built PCs as well. And so that's what we're actually going to talk about today. It's a mini PC in the fact that it's smaller than a regular PC, but it's not like a mini PC like one of these guys. What we're talking about, let me grab it, this is the Asus ROG G22CH. So it's pretty big. It's actually fairly heavy as well. This is a pre-built PC and it's got a full like GPU inside of it. Really impressive performance. We're going to talk about all that. We'll do all the testing. And the thing about this is it's pretty expensive. This is like something like $1,600, depending on the spec that you get. So we are talking about something that is a full desktop replacement. So not thinking about it like a mini PC where you're getting a lot of bang for your buck, but really something that is no compromises when it comes to performance, but in a smaller form factor. And as you can imagine, because they have to cram everything in there, they've got like a proprietary power supply, you know, things like that, then Obviously, it's going to be a little bit more expensive just because they have to piecemeal it all together. I think that in general, you could probably make a small form factor PC for cheaper, but there's also the luxury of having someone else do it for you. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about in terms of topics with this video. Now, because this thing is so powerful, I think it opens up other use cases. So I had some fun in this video as well, just testing out some things that I wouldn't normally do with a mini PC just because this thing has so much power. So we're going to talk about like VR, for example, and even talking about how to split up your PC using a special app so that you could have somebody else running this PC at the same time because it has all that power to spare. Anyway, the way I'm looking at this video is this is not going to be a video where I'm trying to sell you on a PC at all, but really just kind of an investigation of whether or not this kind of mid-range size is going to be a good fit for you. Maybe you don't want something just like a huge big old desktop, or you don't want to build a smaller form factor PC yourself. You want someone else to do it for you. And this is kind of a fascinating look at just what it would be like if you did that. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, as we get started here, just a quick disclaimer. So this was sent over to me for review from Asus, but I'm not being sponsored or paid in any way, and all opinions are my own, and they're not seeing this review ahead of time. And to give you some context, I've had this PC for about two months now, so I've done some pretty thorough testing and just kind of used it in an everyday use case. And to be honest, I was a little bit nervous about agreeing to this review in the first place, just because I felt I was a little bit in over my head when it comes to the PC gaming space. I've always been interested in the idea of a small form factor PC and maybe even building one myself, but as you probably already know, there's a lot to learn about this whole space. However, when it came to pre-built PCs, I thought that starting with this one would probably be the best way to go just because they've been making PCs for so long. This company's been around for like 18 years at this point, and they also have been making these small form factor PCs for quite some time. And so I thought of all the places to start that this one might be the best way to go. Now, generally in my mini PC reviews, I will do a spec breakdown and kind of talk about all your different options. But to be honest, there are so many options for this thing that it's 
kind of hard to put them all together. And so things like the processor and the GPU, all of that is going to be really dependent on the model you choose, and there are eight different options. The first four are relatively cheaper compared to the others, so they can start around $1,400 going up to $1,700. And they'll feature either Core i5 or i7 processors, and you can get an RTX 3060 all the way up to a 4060 Ti Dual. And it's going to be a similar story on the higher end, so these will be between like $1,900 or $2,000. And there's also a range of processor as well as GPUs that you can choose from. Of note, the one they sent me is on the higher end, so it's the far right one that has the RTX 4070 GPU. Now beyond just the processor and GPU, you also have other options. For example, when you get the high spec models, you have the option of changing out between liquid cooling or just your standard air cooling. And I think that's another benefit of having a pre-built PC like this because I've always been scared off from the idea of liquid cooling and so I like the fact that someone else has done it for me. Now other than those three factors of CPU, GPU, and cooling, everything else seems to be the same between the different models. So when it comes to your USB ports or your PCIe slots, all those seem to be the same. And here's a look at the back IO, it's pretty standard. We've got four USB-A ports and then also a gigabit ethernet, and then whatever video hookup your GPU comes with. Also on the top, we have some other IOs. So we've got a headphone jack, a USB-C port, and two USB-A ports. Of note, all three of these are USB 3.2 Gen 2. And then our power button is also gonna be on the top right. Also worth noting, this comes with Wi-Fi 6E dual band as well as Bluetooth 5.3, and it also comes with a couple fancy antennas in the box. And then finally, it has a 600 watt power supply, and this thing is pretty heavy, like I mentioned, it's 18 and a half pounds. Now in terms of where to buy it, you've got plenty of options. One of the great things from using a big manufacturer like this one. So you can buy it directly on their website, but they also offer a couple of the models on Best Buy as well as Amazon, and the price seems to fluctuate between these. In fact, if you read the reviews, some of these were like on sale during Cyber Monday or Black Friday, and so you might be able to look out for sales on these other websites. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the unboxing. When this thing first arrived, I was flabbergasted. This box is huge. At first, I thought they sent me the wrong PC because this is supposed to be a small one. Here's a comparison against a typical mini PC box, and as you can see, yeah, it is night and day. And as you can imagine, when this big box showed up, my wife lost it. She's like, we don't have any space in this house for more crap. But thankfully, it does tear down quite a bit. So inside of this big box, there is a smaller box. And so it's really there for just additional padding, and this smaller size box is exactly what I was expecting. Also of note, if you choose to get the liquid cooling version, it'll come with a transparent side panel like this. Now, I also got a couple accessory boxes. One of them actually had a full keyboard, like even with the 10 key number pad. And this is just kind of one of those standard cheap ones that used to come with like Dell PCs back in the day. So nothing really to write home about, but it is nice to have a wired keyboard board when you need it. Mine also came with a standard mouse. Now this isn't going to be one of those elite gaming mice or anything like that, but it's still nice to have one on hand. And finally, the only other hardware that came in the box was the power cable. Now opening up the box is a pretty cool experience. You just kind of fold it open and then you have two handles and you could just pull everything right out. And this box has some styrofoam padding inside, but then also the computer itself is covered with a cloth protector. So I think between the multiple boxes as well as the cloth padding, we're pretty well covered when it comes to packaging. Further inside, we've got a support page and then also a warranty card and then a quick PC installation guide. And it also has instructions on how to swap out that side panel if you'd like. Speaking of which, let's talk about each of our sides. So the left side is going to have our GPU housing, and this one is going to have a mesh covering. This is not the one that you can trade out. That's going to be on the right side. This one has a little bit of a bulge, as you can see from the case, and this is where you can see the CPU cooler. It also has a mesh covering by default, and it really doesn't stick out that much, maybe a quarter inch altogether. Next, let's go ahead and take a look at how to get inside the PC. On the back here, there's a little rubber nub, and it took me a while to kind of get my finger in there and pull it out, but inside there's a single screw, and once you unscrew that, the latch will be able to pop right open. And as you slide this to the right, the top is going to unlatch and you can just pull it off from there. And you can see up top, there's just a massive heat sink. So no space is wasted here at all when it comes to cooling. Now, once you have the top removed, it's very easy to access the side. So you're just gonna slide it up and it's going to unlatch and then you can pull it off. And so here's a look at the left side. And one thing worth mentioning is that we do have size constraints when it comes to the GPU. So essentially you'll be limited to a two fan GPU setup as opposed to those big old honkers that have three. And taking a further look down below, 
below, we can see there is a power supply here, and this is going to be proprietary from Asus, but it is nice and compact. And then up top, we can get a better look at the case cooling solution. So we have that big old heat sink up top, and then two fairly large and thick case fans right below it. Next, we'll take a look at the right side. This is where a lot of the action is gonna happen. First and foremost, you can see that the CPU cooler with its liquid cooling is right there in the front and center. And we can get another look at that power supply, but from this side. Now, there are a few upgrades that you could do if you would like. For example, in the top left, there is the M.2 Wi-Fi chip. And then right below that is your primary storage. It has a heatsink on it and everything. And then same thing here on the right side, we have our two sticks of RAM. And then further to the right, we have another M.2 slot. So if you wanted to expand your storage with another 2280 drive, you could do that right here. Anyway, that's about it when it comes to upgrade options. I bet that if you really wanted to get in there, you could change out the CPU as well. But I personally would be a little bit nervous just because of that liquid cooling. Now, earlier I mentioned that you do have the option of using a transparent side panel if you do have liquid cooling. And the process is pretty simple. You would just flip over the mesh one and there's a bunch of screws here that you would undo and then you would put the transparent plate there instead. So it is pretty simple, but personally I like this mesh look and so I'm gonna stick with that. Now another thing worth mentioning, on the front I was totally fooled. I thought there was some sort of door right here, maybe it had additional I.O., but really it's just kind of a weird design, none of this stuff opens at all. However, of note, there is RGB lighting on each of these sides here on the front, and I think it looks pretty good, it's not too bright, it's pretty subtle, and so I do enjoy playing with the RGB lights on. And of note, there is also RGB lighting on each side, so if we're looking at the left side we can see there's a little bit below the GPU. And then also the CPU cooler has RGB lighting too. And I like the fact that they're pretty subtle. I wouldn't like this thing to be like a full nightlight, but I think this is just enough. Okay, next let's talk about size. Now this is something I kind of struggled to wrap my head around. And that's because there's a lot of PC case options out there. So this one right here is what they call a mini ITX case. And this is the one I've been using with my primary PC for about four years at this point. And even though this one is relatively small when it comes to desktop PCs, I still kind of consider it to be massive. But there are some benefits of having a larger PC case like this. For example, I can use multiple sizes of GPU and I have space for a cheaper full-size power supply and then also like SATA drives in addition to my M.2. And of course, having a larger size means I'll have more airflow and easier cooling. So there's definitely a big size difference between these two when it comes to desktop PCs. And it does make the small PC that we're reviewing here today look tiny by comparison. It's kind of crazy that this thing has way more power than my full desktop PC. Another way to think about the size comparison would be to consider this more along the lines of a console. So for example, when looking at them face on, it's about the same size as an Xbox Series S, maybe a little bit larger, but the illusion just kind of dissipates when you actually compare them side by side. This thing, after all, is about twice as long as an Xbox Series S. And so if you are looking for a living room PC, this one might be a little bit too big. I think in that case, a mini PC like this one just might be a better size. But of course, bear in mind that the power difference between the two is going to be substantial. Another thing that kind of helped me wrap my head around the size of this device is the fact that it is actually backpackable. And by that, I mean it just fits in a standard backpack. It is heavy, it's 18 and a half pounds. But all the same, over the past two months, I've been throwing this in the backpack and moving back and forth between the house and studio with no problem. So I guess in the end, I would say that yes, it is a PC that you can put in a backpack, which is kind of a novelty idea. And it is somewhat console-like, depending on the console that you're talking about. For example, here's my PS5. This is the old digital version, and it has those dark plates from dbrand just to make it a little bit smaller and more sleek. And I was surprised to find that the size difference between these two is not that different. The PS5 is definitely taller and a little bit thinner, and the ROG PC is also longer, but all the same, it kind of feels like they take up the same amount of space. Anyway, I hope that this comparison helped you in figuring out whether or not this size is going to work in whatever space you have to work with. Next, let's talk about benchmarking and power profile and fan noise. Now at idle, we're getting about a 10 to 20 watt power draw from the CPU, and it seems to stay relatively cool, somewhere around 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. Now next, we're gonna run the multi-core version of Cinebench, and this is gonna be a very CPU intensive test. Now, as soon as I start the test, the CPU goes into turbo mode. So even though the TDP is 125 watts, it was actually pulling something around 220 watts in the first couple minutes. Now this also made the temperature spike quite a bit. So we were getting up to the high 80s in this point. However, after a couple minutes, everything started to stabilize. So the power profile dropped down to about 125 watts. It would go up and down. And then also the CPU temperatures backed off significantly. So instead, we're looking at around an average of 65 degrees Celsius. And so after that quick turbo boost right there in the beginning, everything just kind of normalized at this point. And I think that's pretty good to have 65-ish degree temperatures while running a 100% load benchmark. 
And once the 10 minute test was over, you can see the score was 24,107. And I think that's pretty good for a CPU based test. There are better scores out there. You can get better CPUs, but I think when it comes to things like video editing or using any sort of CPU intensive task like AutoCAD, I think this is going to be plenty. Now to give you a perspective, if we take one of the top of the line mini PCs, those really small ones that have the integrated graphics, these still get pretty good scores as well. They have very powerful CPUs. So the score here for the latest one that I tested was 60. 16,778. And that's about 83% of the performance that we were getting in the ROG PC, which cost about three times the price. However, where the ROG PC is really going to shine is when it comes to GPU based benchmarks or gaming. For example, here is my 3D Mark Time Spy score, 17,316. And this score is over five times better than the mini PC that we were just talking about earlier. And I think that makes sense given the fact that ROG stands for Republic of Gamers, right? This is a very gaming centric PC and that really shows right here. Now additional power means additional heat and that also means that it's gonna have to have additional cooling. So let's do a rudimentary test of fan noise. First, we're gonna use a directional mic pretty close to the PC so we can get an idea of the overall sound profile of the cooling. And then also I'm going to use an audio meter about two feet away and this is mostly to give you an idea of what it's going to be like when you're actually gaming. So we're getting between 43 and 44 decibels as a reference point but also bear in mind that the ambient noise in my room is relatively loud. And when actually playing a game, I've pushed this one up to 4K and Ultra, so it's really taxing out the system. You can see that the fan noise does increase quite a bit, so we're looking at somewhere between like 48 and 49 decibels. Now those numbers don't really mean much other than the fact that they are a little bit higher than they were at idle. So I'm going to shut up for a moment so you can hear what the fan actually is going to sound like. To give you a comparison, here is my other larger PC, and this one is a little quieter, and I also found that the sound profile is more pleasant to my ear. And then finally to round it out, here is that B-Link mini PC that I showed off in the intro. And this one is a lot quieter. Even when pushed to max load, it's about the same level of noise as the ROG PC was when at idle. And overall, I don't really find these results to be that surprising. After all, the ROG PC is basically a full PC that's been pushed into a much smaller form factor. And so I'm not surprised that the fan noise is about the same as a desktop because it has a lot of cooling it has to do. Anyway, my main point here is just the fact that yes, this is going to be very similar to a regular desktop when it comes to overall fan noise. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and start moving into our game testing. This is going to be somewhat brief just because this is such a powerful machine. But I did want to show off quite a few games that I tested over the past couple months. And for the most part, I'm going to stick with 4K settings if possible. There are going to be a couple games where I'll have to drop it down just a little bit. And I'm also going to try to find the best balance between settings and frame rate. In addition, for most of these games, I'll be turning off these things. So you might see some screen tearing, but I want to make sure I get the maximum frames. And I've got an old cheaper capture card, and that's why you're seeing the screen tearing because it doesn't have VRR support. Either way, starting out with Doom Eternal, you can see that 4K with Nightmare settings is giving us an average of about 170 frames per second. Another game I love to test is Grid. This is one of my favorite racing games just because of the amount of variety that you have in it. And this one's playing at 4K ultra high settings with an average frame rate of about 85 or 90. Another one of my favorite games is Destiny 2. This one is at 4K high settings. That's the highest it'll go. And you can see I'm getting an average frame rate of about 115 frames per second. That's pretty insane. Now God of War at ultra settings is really demanding. So here with 4K ultra, I had to actually lock it to 60 frames per second just to give me a more smooth experience. And for me personally, I think that ultra settings in this game is just overkill. I can't see the difference between ultra and high, so I usually would just play it in high anyway. Now, one thing to bear in mind, this is capable of ray tracing, but it will take a hit in performance. So for example, here with Witcher 3, 4K ray tracing with ultra settings, I did find that it wasn't giving me a consistent 60 frames per second. So something's going to have to give here. You may have to turn off ray tracing or maybe turn down the settings a little bit. It's a similar story with Elden Ring. This is with 4K and high settings, which is the highest it'll go and then ray tracing set to medium. And these settings really push the PC. We're getting about 40 frames per second on average. And I did find that a lot of these high-end games would cap out if you did 4K and ultra settings and ray tracing. And I think Cyberpunk 2077 is a great example. This one averaged about 50 frames per second. 
So I think in a lot of these games that do have ray tracing options, you know, something like control, you may have to drop down the resolution or the settings. For this game in particular, I found that dropping it down to 1440p gave me a super stable 60 frames per second, and so this is probably where I would play it. And in this game, when you push the settings and the ray tracing to the highest they will go, it still looks amazing, so I would probably just keep it here. Either way, it's really going to come down to the game, but I think that most games will play in 4K. Whether or not it's going to also use ray tracing will be another story, but as you you can imagine this is a ton of power. Just playing these games in 4K Ultra is just kind of an amazing experience. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about emulation, but I'm only going to do a couple systems just because everything below this is going to play perfectly. We'll start with Nintendo Switch using the Yuzu emulator, so this is going to be in docked mode with a 2x resolution, which means for most games that'll be 4K. And some great examples are going to be Super Mario Bros. Wonder as well as Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. And these games are playing no problem. There was a couple stutters in the beginning when the shaders were compiling, but then after that it is really smooth sailing. So if you want super high graphics when it comes to Nintendo Switch and everything below, it's going to be fine and it's going to be a very similar story with PlayStation 3. Now this one I actually turned to a 3x resolution which will also be 4k and it really depends on the game of whether or not it's going to render all of those textures correctly and so in some cases it does look pretty good but I wouldn't actually call this 4k. Demon Souls seems to be a little bit fuzzy still and same thing with Infamous. It definitely looked great and it was playing really good an average frame rate at about 58 frames per second but it didn't quite look like 4k to me and a lot of that probably has to do with the render of the 3D graphics, but all the same, this is a really good demonstration of how much power we have to work with. Probably the ultimate game to test is going to be God of War 3. Even when I had shaders compiling, it still stayed well above 30 frames per second and a lot closer to 60. Now, I'm not really sure if there's any PC that'll actually play this game at a full 60 frames per second stably, but this is definitely the closest I've ever gotten, especially at this 3x upscaled resolution. Maybe at some point, Sony is going to get their act together and actually release an HD or PS5 version of God of War 3, but at least as it stands right now, this is probably the closest you can get. Just bear in mind that emulation problems will still exist even though you have a bunch of power. So for example with Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes, this game runs great in an average of about 55 frames per second at a 3x resolution, but it still has emulation compatibility issues, and so as a result it doesn't really look that great because we have that graphical artifacting. So in summary, when it comes to just regular old PC gaming as well as emulation, this thing is a beast. It can play basically everything that you can think of at some of the max settings that you could use. And this inspired me to go down a couple different other rabbit holes, just in the idea that this could be pushed even further. And the first idea I had was to use it with PC VR. I just picked up the MetaQuest 3 recently, and so I thought this would be a good time to try it out. There's a few different ways that you can actually set this up. You could use a wired connection, but there's an app called Virtual Desktop. It's about 20 dollars and everybody recommends that. And so I ended up picking that one up and I agree. I think this one is really great, especially because it's wireless. So all you have to do is install the app on your MetaQuest 3 and then also the PC. And from there, they just kind of sync up and connect to one another. From there, you can control your PC from the MetaQuest and it's actually pretty awesome. It's a huge screen and I couldn't feel any sort of lag at all. It felt seamless. From there, when you start up a VR capable game from the PC, it's going to know that you're connected with a VR headset and it's just going to go into VR mode. And I found the transition between the two to be effortless. You basically would just pick your game, start it up, and it would go into PC VR. And of course, the first game I had to try was Half-Life Alex. I actually bought this game years ago in the hopes that someday I would have a VR capable PC and headset. So it's just kind of a dream come true for me to be able to play PC VR games, and the greatest thing about this is that I can max out the settings. So not only on the PC am I pushing the game to as far as it can go from a graphic standpoint, but then also with the virtual desktop software, I'm also pushing that as far as it can go as well. It's obviously not going to be the same as that like $3,000 Apple headset, but I am super happy with this. It was a really immersive experience. I've actually been thinking about making a video about the VR experience to include PC gaming and emulation, so let me know in the comments down below if that's something you'd be interested in watching. Anyway, going back to the PC itself, I did want to note that this thing can handle these games with no problem whatsoever. I know that Half-Life Alex is somewhat older now, it's been around for a few years, but even then it was hitting the target 90 frames per second without breaking a sweat. In fact, it's only taking about 80% of the GPU power. And so I think that is an additional use case for this ROG PC that you wouldn't be able to find in a mini PC that has integrated graphics. You can use this as a full dedicated PC VR setup. 
In fact, my kids have been loving it. They've been making excuses about how they need to go to the studio for one reason or the other. And then as soon as they get here, they're like, hey, dad, can we try out VR? And so here I am introducing the world of Half-Life to my 14-year-old son. It's way overdue at this point. This kid needs to go through all these games. Now, another unexpected benefit of using that virtual desktop app is that I can just play regular old PC games as well. And this is a pretty great experience too, because essentially it's going to black out everything around you and makes it really immersive and you can make the screen as big as you would like. And given the fact that this PC has so much power, I can crank up the settings and play these games in like a really high 4K resolution. And I found this to be a very immersive gaming experience. Now, I haven't been able to do this for long periods of time, about 20 minutes is my average. And that's just because I found the headset to be a little bit heavy. I'm not used to using a VR headset, and so I get headaches if I go longer than that. Either way, I've had a great time playing 2D PC games, but in a virtual environment. In fact, it's become my preferred way to play just short bursts of first-person shooter games. It's a really cool experience. Now, another idea I had when using a really beefy PC like this is an option called multi-seating. There's an app called Duo that I featured before, and this is a really unique way of streaming games to another PC or a handheld. Now, when you usually think about streaming, you think about something like Moonlight, where it'll take over your PC and then you'll stream that screen over to something else, for example, like a Steam Deck or another handheld. What makes this app special is that it actually splits apart your PC. So you can actually still continue to use your PC as normal, but then someone else will be using a different profile, but the exact same resources on the same PC. And given the fact that the ROG PC that we're reviewing here today is so powerful, splitting it up like this is not that big of a deal. On my monitor, the PC is just running as normal. I can do web browsing or even play some games, but then on my Steam Deck, I'm running Moonlight and it's making its own PC environment there as well. So for example, if I logged into a different Steam account on my Moonlight version on the Steam Deck, I can then access the same games that are actually installed on the main PC, but from a different account. Now, I know this is a little bit complex, but just kind of let me walk you through why this would be a pretty cool experience. For example, if you have one PC in the house, but you have multiple people who want to play games, this is a way you could set that up. But this would also be beneficial for an x86 handheld like the Steam Deck. And that's because all the processing power is still happening with that ROG PC. After all, the Moonlight app is very lightweight. It's just going to be streaming that content over. And so as a result, you'll have excellent battery life when trying to play a game on the Steam Deck. And of course, streaming has its own benefits and shortcomings. A lot of it will depend on your local Wi-Fi. And so you might get some lag here and there, but personally, I didn't experience any at all. Either way, a lot of other people have been testing the same app with the Steam Deck, and they've been getting about nine hours of battery life, which is pretty incredible. And also bear in mind that you can still play everything at high settings, and then also somebody else can be using the same PC at the same time. So it is kind of a best of both worlds scenario, and I think having a really powerful PC like this one really just adds to that benefit. Now, the Duo app is for Free, but if you're a patron, it does unlock some other benefits. For example, you can unlock the frame rate and then it also now supports HDR. And so specifically, this is going to be a great solution for the Steam Deck OLED. And so not only can you stream AAA games with high settings over to the Steam Deck from a VPPC like this one, but if you have the OLED version, you can also do it in HDR if the game supports it. Anyway, I thought that was pretty neat, but I think that's about the end of my testing. So let's go ahead and start wrapping up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the G22CH. To start, I think the number one benefit of this PC is the fact that it is small and compact. If you're short on space or maybe you want to actually put your PC on your desktop, this might be a good solution. In addition, I would consider this PC to be full performance. I could definitely tax it all the way, but those moments were few and far between and it really only happened if I was using ray tracing. Either way, the performance did exceed what I was expecting at around this price point, so I was really impressed. I also like the fact that this thing is so powerful that it opened up new options for me and my own gameplay style. You know, playing games like PC VR, but then also using that Duo app to be able to split everything. And even though it is pre-built, I did appreciate the fact that it is mostly upgradable. You can change out the storage and the RAM and even the GPU, but there will be some constraints which we'll talk about here in a moment. I also appreciated the fact that it's pretty easy to access everything. You do have to take out that one screw that first time, but then after that you can take apart everything without a screwdriver. And then finally, one of my favorite things about it is that the pre-built PC experience is very convenient. It kind of reminds me of the old days when I would order like a PC from Gateway or Dell and I would just kind of spend all this time configuring it the way I wanted. And then a couple weeks later, a PC would show up in the mail and it would be exactly how I ordered it. Now, of course, building PCs is a hobby in and of itself. But again, if you don't want to mess around with that stuff, this is a pretty great experience as well. Now, like with any review I make, nothing is perfect. And so there are a couple things I want to talk 
talk about that I didn't like about it. Number one is gonna be the fan noise. This thing was basically desktop class in terms of performance, but then also in noise. And I think one of the reasons why people are drawn to those really small mini PCs is because they have a low amount of noise and then also a low power draw. And in those regards, I would say that this PC is no different than any other regular desktop. So it is gonna be quite noisy and power consuming. Additionally, even though it is upgradable, you do have some limited GPU options. Essentially, you're gonna be limited to GPUs that have two fans. This is a 10 liter case and so there there are some size constraints. And then finally, there's gonna be a trade-off when it comes to price. For example, I just spent a couple minutes on PC Part Picker, I picked the exact same CPU and GPU, and then I grabbed a bunch of other compatible parts and I didn't really look at the price, I just kind of picked things that matched. And as a result, it's gonna be a larger PC, but even then, I saved about $230 between the two. And keep in mind, I wasn't bargain hunting here, I wasn't looking for sales, I was just kind of grabbing stuff off the website. So if you do want a smaller form factor PC and something that's pre-built, it is gonna come at a premium. And at the end of the day, whether or not that's gonna be a good match for you is really gonna come down to your own use case and what you're looking for within your budget. It's gonna come down to a few factors. Do you wanna have a PC that's very powerful? Do you also want it to be small? And do you want someone else to make it for you? And if all three of those factors are important to you, then yes, I could see the G22CH being a great fit. However, if any of those three features are not important to you, then you can definitely find something better and cheaper. You could save money by building it yourself or getting a larger PC or even getting something small if you don't mind losing a bit of power. As for me, I found that I had a great time testing out this PC, but I'm not really sure if I personally would have shelled out two grand to get the same experience. I can definitely see why PC gamers want to go to the high end of the spectrum, but personally, I'm more of a budget-minded person. And so I'm not sure how many more of these really high-scale PC reviews I will do in the future. I really like to stick to the cheaper stuff. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Would you like to see more videos like this, or should I stick to the cheaper mini PCs? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.